Who wants to go to South America with me now? <laughs> Pretty sure I've been on that bus, on that road, but uh, incredible. Yeah, we, we have been in some hairy situations like that, and that, that's what it looks like when you don't have guardrails in your life, and uh, that's what it looks like when you don't have guardrails on your road, and you'll kind of see how that parallels for the next five weeks. I want to encourage you over the course, and hello to everybody watching online. We love you. We never forget about you. We're so thankful for each and every one. And thank you guys. Some of you came from the 10 o'clock service. How many of you came from the 10 o'clock service? Raise your hand. Yes, it worked. The plan worked. Anybody come from the noon service? Okay, that's, that's brave because I really didn't think any of them would make it. They don't even get here until 1220. So, yeah. Oh, okay, you're serving. All right, good job. Good job. Yeah, you know, it's amazing when we, we think about uh, what God is doing in this ministry. It's so, so exciting. Last week, and I have to give you... All the, all the praise and give God all the glory, 89 people came to know Jesus last weekend. Is that amazing? Amazing. You know, it's really cool. We have some of these young, amazing worship leaders uh, as interns from CCU, and some of them have made the comment that they've just never seen anything like this. And a lot of times what, what they're talking about is that most ministries will have maybe once a year, they'll do like a gospel weekend. And uh, for us, every weekend is the gospel weekend. Every weekend, you have people that don't know Jesus. Every weekend, you may have people that have been here forever come to that point in their life where they go, now I'm making that decision to trust Christ. And so that's just a profound miracle. And we get the privilege of seeing it 89 times. We had, I think, five or six come to Christ on the interactive website during the services. Uh, we had some in the overflow in the lodge that came to know Christ their Savior. You know, when they're raising their hand to a screen, you know they're, they're locked in to what's happening. Uh, so it's just really, really grateful. I want to let you know just something. We've, we've postponed the family conference, the Healthy Family Conference, to give you more time to sign up for it. It's going to be a four-hour conference. It'll be in the fall. Watch your bulletin. Look at the website. However you communicate with us, the free mobile app. Make sure you stay in touch. Uh, we'll be letting you know as we get closer. This gives us an opportunity. We were competing with some of the end-of-the-year stuff going on, some of the kids' sports. We want to try and get it to a point right before all the booming fall stuff happens and uh, get as many of you here as possible. I know everybody wants a healthy family, and so be a part of this. You know, as I, as I think about guardrails, I don't, I don't know about you, but I have needed the services of guardrails twice in my driving life. Uh, you should never need it once, but I needed it twice. I'll never forget, I was 16, was dating a girl a little bit older than me, lived up in Golden, and uh, midnight, I'm taking her back to the house, and my, my Camaro actually uh, was dead when we were getting ready to leave the house, so I said, Dad, can I use your car? And he really hesitated, because this is the mid-80s, and he bought a 1977 Cadillac. Uh, no, he was a foster dad, he wasn't a pimp, but we, I, so anyways, I... I go, yeah, I'm going to take the Cadillac. So I got in the Cadillac, and I, I drove her up to her house and dropped her off. And, and then as I'm getting on I-70 off Colfax, there's no traffic. And I'm like, you know, I want to try this cruise control thing. That was a really, that was like the modern, you know, uh, drive your own car kind of thing that the Teslas have now, right? Only they actually drive your car. And, uh, and so I'm driving 70 miles an hour. I'm in the fast lane, no other cars. I'm, I'm coming down uh, from I-70 I in Colfax and I put it in cruise control and I pull my feet away from the gas and I'm like, whoa, this is cool. This is really cool. And I'm just kind of cruising in the caddy, you know? And I thought, you know what's really cool is I don't have to use my feet at all. So I put him up on the bench seat like this, and I'm like, oh, yeah, 
Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I just kind of dozed off. Next thing I know, I'm going straight at the guardrail on the side of the highway. I mean, straight at it. And the glistening of the guardrail from the street light just kind of alerted me. And I, I overcorrected, but I didn't, you know, crash. I got, just did the whole fishtail thing. And then your knees are weak. And you think you're, you came very close to die. I don't think I came very close. I did come very close to dying, but that was a common exercise in my life. Anyways, I got back on I-70 and I never used cruise control in my dad's car ever again. But I mean, if that guardrail had not been there, what was there at the time was about a 15 foot ravine. And then there was a drop off on what is now Youngsfield. It wasn't all nice like it is now. That guardrail kept me from danger. Now, here's the deal. If I'd have hit the guardrail, I'd have needed body shop work on my dad's Cadillac. Of course, I'd have, I'd have been dead. My dad would have killed me. But normally, normally, you hit a guardrail, you might need work on your car, but you don't need the hospital. You don't need the morgue. And that's the same principle I want you to think about as we cover these very important guardrails. Last night after the message, I had a lady come up to me, and she's with her husband, and in tears, she said, we needed these guardrails. We need them so bad. And I said, listen, we all need them. We all need guardrails in our life. What is a guardrail? Well, first of all, it's a system designed to keep vehicles from straying into dangerous places. I think we all know that. And as Coloradans, we have no problem with guardrails, do we? Because in Colorado, you want a guardrail, or be, or otherwise you're going off you know, 500-foot cliff. We want guardrails. You look at that guardrail right there, I mean, this guardrail will save your life. And notice something about it. You know, this, this guardrail isn't set on the side of that bridge at an angle. That would just be a ramp to your death. It's put in what I call the safe zone. The safe zone is where they put the guardrail. If this was a guardrail on the side of a mountain road, according to CDOT standards, it would be four to six feet from the edge. It would be in the safe zone. So you don't put guardrails in the danger zone. They don't do any good in the danger zone. By the time you get to the danger zone, you've already entered danger and you're in trouble. So the guardrail that we're talking about is a spiritual guardrail. What is that? You might jot this down. It's a standard or behavior that becomes a matter of conscience that serves as a guardrail for my life. Now, we live in a culture today that isn't big on guardrails. I want you to think about it. Christian guardrails are standards, practices, and disciplines to protect our lives. And here's the good news. For some of us, we have a chance to establish guardrails for the first time. Maybe you're younger and you just didn't have guardrails established by your parents, or maybe you did and you didn't like them. You have a chance to establish guardrails. Maybe for some of us, you're like, I wished I'd have had them. Would have saved me a lot of regret. Well, you have a chance to reestablish guardrails. Now, I'm going to just tell you, it's not popular in this culture. All right? Our culture that we live in today doesn't like guardrails. As a matter of fact, our culture is content with painted lines. Let me give you an example. All right? Here's, a, here's an example of a painted line. Drink responsibly. Now, that's great. That's great if you can drink responsibly. How many alcoholics and how many people that party too hard on the weekends think they're drinking responsibly? Drink responsibly is a painted line. It's a suggestion. Here's another one. This is a painted line in our culture. We tell it to our teenagers, you know, our, our, our young adults getting ready for college. Hey, son. Hey, hey daughter. Um, Wait until you're ready to have sex. Now, I am pretty sure a woman came up with that slogan. Because a girl might, might be able to, okay, I'm going to wait until I'm ready to have sex. You ask a teenage boy, are you ready to have sex? He's like, I was born ready. <laughs> That's reality. So that is a painted line. It doesn't do much for us. Painted lines don't keep you inside the parameters that save your life. Now, 
I, I have an individual in my life that actually helped me establish guardrails at a young age. And he was my basketball coach. He was my Bible teacher. For a while, he was a youth pastor uh, for my wife and myself when we were just high school, junior high and high school students. He and his wife taught in this school. They were young teachers. And I'm really, really thankful for the years of established relationship and the way that God brought us back together about 20 years ago when I called him and said, Mark, we need you to come back and be our youth pastor. And Mark came, moved his family. He and Kim agreed, brought three kids, moved back to Colorado from Florida and were our, they were our, he was our youth pastor, and then he trained the next youth pastor, and then became a family care pastor. And today, for many, many, many years, Mark has served as an incredible Christian education pastor. And we're going to talk about this first week of establishing guardrails that protect our lives. So you, will you welcome our Christian ed pastor, Mark Schweitzer, to the stage? Ring him out. <laughs> Appreciate you, man. Thanks, bro. You know, I I always tell people, Mark is an incredible athlete. They're like, Mark? Why do they say that? (laughs) Used to be. Yeah, I'm like, he was an incredible athlete. Uh, Mark, thank you, man. I appreciate you being here. And and really, I I, want to say it again. I appreciate all that you and Kim did to pour into my life and Shelly's life and Barry and Scott and so many other people in this ministry. There's many, many other students. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for the kind words. I think I wrote handsome down there. You too. did write handsome down there. I, I'm sorry I you skipped that it. one. <laughs> Mark, tell us a little bit really about uh, what you spend your majority of time doing. A lot of people don't mm-hmm. know exactly what a Christian ed department is, and we're about the only church that I know of that has a Christian ed department. Well, uh, first of all, I really consider it a privilege to be able to work here at Grace Church to get paid for what I do, what I love to do the most. I'd, I'd probably pay them to let me teach. <laughs> okay, if, we can make that yes, happen. Yes, I know, I shouldn't have said that. Uh, no, seriously, the, the Christian Education Department uh, here at Grace Church is part of our Grow and Serve team that's headed up by uh, Pastor Vicki DC. And, um, you know, we are all on a spiritual journey, if you're yeah. a believer. We're all on a spiritual journey. And that spiritual journey is to be like Jesus, to follow in his steps. And the Bible is, is where that journey is defined. It tells us from the time, day we trust Christ to the day we're uh, in heaven with God, uh, the path that we should be on. And wherever you are on that journey, wherever a person is on that journey, you always have a next step to take. So we want to help people take that next step in their spiritual growth. So whether it's myself, Pastor Vicki, Pastor Mitchell, Pastor Paul, who still comes, even though he's at CCU, he still comes and does our Mm eight-hour classes on Saturday. We want to give people the opportunity to learn what the Bible says, because that's where our walk, our journey starts with. We have to know what God wants us to do. If we don't, then we can't take the next step. So we want to give, uh, help everybody see what their next step is, and then encourage them to take it. So good. Mark, isn't it true that really culture or society mocks when you set guardrails? They mock you. But then when you go over the edge, then they demoralize you. I was thinking about the, the slap heard around the world during the yeah. Academy Awards. And, you know, here's, here's Chris Rock just doing what he does. And Will Smith goes up and slaps him. And then all these people who promote violence more than any other humans on the planet are like, oh, I can't believe it happened. Yes. And it's just interesting that, you know, they're the first to throw the other under the bus, mm-hmm. but they're also promoting constantly, you don't need guardrails, just do what's best for you. Whatever you want to do feels good, right? Amen. Um, you know, they tell us there's no strings attached anymore to your behavior. You can do as long as you don't hurt someone else. But as soon as you cross a line and do the thing that they don't like, then they're going to condemn you and they're going to bury you. That's right. Cancel you. That's right. Well, there's really four principles, Mark, that that really help us establish guardrails. They are a product of these four principles. Mm -hmm. Get get us started. Um, So as with everything in the Christian life, um, your spiritual journey with God starts with a birth. Now, your physical 
uh, life also started with a birth. You were born into this word, world physically. Well, your spiritual life starts the same way. You experience a birth. Mm -hmm. And so the first birth is where, or um, excuse me, the second birth is where everything starts for us as believers. Yeah. You know, Jesus clearly taught that every person's journey with God begins just like their physical life did. Mm -hmm. You were born. The same is true for your spiritual life. You were born. The moment you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, you were born into God's family. Look what it says here in John chapter 3, verse 3. It says, Jesus replied, I tell you for certain that you must be born from above before you can see God's kingdom. Nicodemus asked, how can a grown man ever be born a second time? Jesus answered, I tell you for certain that before you can get into God's kingdom, you must be born not only by water, but by the Spirit. Humans give life to their children, yet only God's Spirit can change you into a child of God. So don't be surprised when I say that you must be born from above. You see, the Bible tells us that as a non-believer, a person who doesn't believe in Christ, who hasn't trusted them as their Savior, they were born once, but they're going to die twice. So you're born physically the first time, but then if you never trust as Christ as your Savior, you never received a second birth. And so you're going to die physically, but then you're also going to die spiritually. You're going to be separated from God forever. But if you're a child of God, you've been born twice, so you're only going to die once. You were born physically, and in the day you trusted Christ as your Savior, you were born spiritually. So when you die physically, that's the only death you're going to experience. And if we're here when the Lord comes back, we might not even have to experience that. That's right. That's right. You know, what's interesting is that these are precepts upon precepts, just like the Bible talks about. So you have to have the second birth to understand and even be able to live out the second principle that produces guardrails in our life. And it's this spiritual growth, spiritual growth. Now, I believe that all of you here and all of you watching as Christians desire spiritual growth. Now, some of you may be like, man, I'm just looking for an answer to my problems. I'm looking to see if this is legit. I'm not sure what I believe. And listen, we're glad you're here. But the, the Christian life is about receiving eternal life by faith alone, the second birth. You're born again, born into the family of God. You cannot be unborn. He will never lose you. He'll never forsake you. He can't love you more than he does. He'll never love you less. Now it's up to you. Will you, Christian, grow spiritually or will you just stay an infant? And it's a couple of words that I want to define and, and kind of put in a definition. Hopefully we can understand because they're, they're big words when you see them or you hear them. The first is salvation. Mark just explained it. That's the second birth. It's a gift received by faith in Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection alone without any action on my part. That equals eternity with Jesus. There are people that will say that. There are even Christians that will say that. And then they'll say, but, you know, you got to keep living this way. Or you better not do that. My friends, that is a conditional love. And that's not God's love. That's not grace. Grace is unmerited favor. I get what I don't deserve. I get heaven because of Jesus. But sanctification is a lifelong process. It's obedience in response to my salvation produced by practicing spiritual disciplines while yielding to the Holy Spirit. That's a, lot, that's a mouthful. When you come to know Jesus, you have the second birth. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. And that means you get a temporary life on this planet, a temporary life of fulfilling God's purposes. Now look at Ephesians 1, 17. <coughs> We're going to be in Ephesians a little bit today. Asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might, circle this, grow, grow. And how do you grow? In your knowledge of God. Mark, that's really kind of the difference. You know, the, the preacher, the pastor, the, you know, what I do is teaching people the application of scripture 
we've got, you know, 40 minutes on a weekend to do that. There's only so much that can be covered. I always love when people come up, oh, pastor, could you talk? Why didn't you talk about this? Why didn't we cover that verse? I'm like, well, we'd be here three hours every week, and Mm -hmm. I doubt you would be. So uh, that's my job, and it's to give the gospel and to really connect with those, especially that don't know Jesus. But you get the privilege of taking them deeper. You said it's more the knowledge and insight. And as you Mm -hmm. As you do that, Mark, share a little bit just of your testimony of how you came to Christ. Yeah, I was, uh, I was raised in a church uh, from the time I was very young, and I learned a lot of things at church. I learned uh, that the Bible was God's Word. I learned that Jesus was God. I learned that He died on a cross for our sins, but I had never actually read the Bible myself. Mm-hmm. I never had looked at it and never had even cracked it open. And finally, when someone started to share with me what the Bible said, what I began to see was there were some things that I had been taught at church that the Bible did not agree with. In fact, the Bible said something different. Probably the big one was that I was taught at church that if I'm a good boy, good boys go to heaven, bad boys go to hell. Well, the problem is, is there are no good boys, right, ladies? You all know that. (laughs) There are no good boys. We're all sinners. We're all, none of us are perfect. And so no matter how hard we try, we could never earn God's favor. And so that was just eye-opening to me. So I trusted Christ my Savior, and I could have, um, I could have spent the next five years or so trying to figure out what does that mean? You know, what does God want from me? But I was lucky enough to be connected with a group of believers who taught us that. And so I learned what it meant to be a believer and what God expected to me very early on, pretty quickly. And what that did for me is it allowed me to grow spiritually at a quicker rate. See, whenever you your walk with God, there is knowledge involved. You have to know what God says. And so the quicker you understand that, then the quicker you can grow. And that's really what our Christian Ed Department's all about, is just helping people to grow in their walk with God. You're getting ready to do something that I think is so critical and so timely as we've had so many come to Christ this year and obviously 89 last weekend. And don't take this as an insult. If you're a new believer, you're a baby in Christ. That's a good thing. That's a beautiful, you have to start there. We all do. And by the way, nobody ever gets to say, I'm a mature Christian now. If you're that person, stop saying it because you're one dumb decision from infancy all over again. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's just remember that. So we never arrive this side of eternity. But being a baby, we need to have the direction. And we have a class that you're starting next weekend. Tell us about it. Uh, Yeah, our Fresh Start with uh, God class is basically Christianity 101. So maybe you were like me where um, you heard some things that the Bible said. But you never actually read it for yourself. So what we want to do is we want to offer this class. If you've recently trusted Christ your Savior, or if you were like me, maybe you went to a church, but you never looked at the Bible yourself. Uh, we really just want to explain what does it mean when you trust Christ as Savior? How have you changed? Uh, what does God want from you? Hmm. And so we'd love to encourage you to come because I know that type of stuff really helped me when I first became a Christian. Yeah, it works together. I give you the application, the motivation, hopefully the inspiration. They give you the information and the knowledge that you need. One without the other is not healthy. And don't expect that to happen on the weekends when we're covering multiple topics and multiple series. Get involved in the Christian ed department. You will grow. Look at this in Colossians 2.7. It's, it's a command. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. I just want you to think about that. Let your roots go down. Let, let, let it grow strong. And I think about the redwoods and the sequoias in Northern California, those massive trees, hundreds of feet in the air. Some you can drive a car through, they're so large. Do you know their roots don't go down but a few feet? Actually, a little less than two feet. So how does it establish the kind of strength to withstand the storms? Because they're all connected together. And when you become a part of the body of Christ, you need each other. We need each other. Mark will talk about that more in a moment. But listen, listen to this. It's the work before the work that needs to be done. And for all of us, that's my encouragement. Do the work before the work. 
And what that means is this simply. You got to be in the word. You can't just be spoon fed the rest of your life. You can't just depend on one guy or a group of people to teach you. You have to allow God to feed you and we give you the tools to make that happen. Mark, what's the third principle? So the third, um, and I believe that this is one of the main guardrails that God gives to us. And it's this next point, your church family, your church family. You know, your church family is probably the most important thing you have to help you stay on the road to spiritual maturity. It's, you know, it's within the church family that we get encouragement. It's get where we get accountability and those people in your life that are Christians can help you to stay in your spiritual growth where you should be going. Look at what it says here in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 24 and 25. It says, discover creative ways to encourage each other and to motivate them toward acts of compassion, doing beautiful works as expressions of love. This is not the time to pull away and neglect meeting together as some have formed the habit of doing. In fact, we should come together even more frequently, eager to encourage and urge each other onward as we anticipate that day dawning. I think that we have just come out of a period of time in our country where we need the truth of this verse more than ever. You know, we just spent two or three years being told, isolate yourself, remove yourself from everyone else. Don't go around groups of people. And yet this verse tells us that as the church, we have to meet together. We have to get together. Our brothers and sisters in Christ are the people who encourage us. They're the people who build us up. It's the local church where the life of the church happens that God's family interacts. And so I think that we need to do the opposite as believers. Instead of isolating, we need to always be together. You know, I think it's Satan who wants to isolate us because he knows if he can get us by ourselves, Mm -hmm. disconnected from everybody else, he can beat us, he can defeat us easily. He's too strong for us. We can't resist him. God never intended the church or for a Christian to be the Lone Ranger Christian. There is no such animal. You know, even the Lone Ranger wasn't alone, was he? No. No, he had, he had Tonto. Yeah, my people. <laughs> I can do that. So now, I, I understand one thing COVID's done for us is it's shown us how much easier it is just to sit home on the couch and watch church. <laughs> yeah. Okay? That is so much more comfortable than coming and sitting uh, in these chairs. But you know... I don't think that's what God really wants us to do. Now, if you don't live in the area and the only way you're able to be here is online, praise the Lord, we're glad you're with us. Mm -hmm. But if you live in this area and you're still separating yourself from other believers, that is not healthy. In fact, you know, there may be those of you who are introverts like me. You know, I'm, I can go to a party, sit in the corner and watch everybody, never talk and be perfectly content. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, that's how I am. And if you're like me, maybe your guardrail for this particular time is I need to step out of my comfort zone and get connected with other believers. I need to make, be there on Sunday morning so I can worship together with other believers. And so it's so important that Satan tries to make us think we can do it on our own, but there's no way that we can because Christian fellowship is all about sharing our lives together, helping I help you to grow, you help me to grow. That's right. We're better together. On May 22nd, we're having group launch. You know, last night I referenced Scott and Tina Hoftailing, uh, who uh, shared with Shelly and I a couple of weeks ago when we were together that they came to the last group launch and that's where their small group was born from. And now those six couples are their dearest friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, literally, that's what happens. And so May 22nd, mark it down, make it a priority. Because the New Testament church grew larger and smaller at the same time. And in a church with thousands of members, you're never going to connect if you don't get involved in a small group. And it won't help you grow. And that's, that brings up the next point in your outline And I think this is one of the best things that we provide as a church, as guardrails to our people, is to get into a small group now. 
You know, the small group is just the, it's just the church. I mean, if you're like me and you're the introvert, the small group is perfect because it's a small group. Yeah. It's not a big group like this. But, you know, that's where the work of the church happens. That's where we minister and serve each other is in our small groups. So if you're not, part, even if you're online, we would love to give you, get you in a small group. You can do a Zoom small group with other people. And so we all need to be connected together and not let Satan divide us. Yeah. Second birth, spiritual growth, church family, and finally God's word. Everything we've said centers around God's word. You know, there are actually people that teach preaching that say, never say that in church on the weekends, God's word, only say Bible. Listen, I want you to understand something. The Bible you have is the inspired word of God. And the only inerrant thing that we have in our presence is his word that we can trust completely. I think about last week, I talked about Peter, the disciple who betrayed Jesus, ran for his life, literally was a coward, and then after the resurrection became one of the greatest evangelists of all time and died a martyr's death happily. And he said this, look at 1 Peter 2, 2. In the same way that nursing infants cry for milk, you must intensely crave the pure spiritual milk of God's word. For this milk will cause you to grow into maturity, fully nourished and strong for life. I always get upset. There's these Christians that'll, well, you need the meat of the word, not the milk of the word. Have you read the Bible? It says you need to want milk because it helps you grow to maturity. You should always want, you should have the desire and zeal of a new baby Christian. That's what we want to maintain. I love God's word. I can't get enough of God's word. I've been reading it for 45 years. Now, let me just say this. Um, in our ministry, we help you do that. But I want you to have this image in mind. My, my youngest daughter just had our sixth grandchild. And JJ is big like his daddy and his mom. They're both very tall, okay? And JJ's big. He's like 10 months old, 11 months old, or excuse me, 11 weeks old. He looks 11 months old. And uh, he's wearing six-month-old clothes, you know, that kind of deal. Well, he's so chill. He just smiles, just so chill till he's hungry. And then it is game on. He goes from zero to 10. I mean, literally, wah, feed me, right? And I, go, I said to my daughter the other night, does he eat like every 30 minutes? She goes, every 30 minutes, <laughs> my poor daughter. But you know what? That's the kind of hunger we want for the word of God because it gives us the guardrails that protect and establish six critical areas in my life. Real quick, just look at them. I think I'll put them on your outline. Your personal conduct. Your personal conduct. That's, that's really how you're viewed by the world around you. Christians, you're the only Bible someone will ever read. You're the only Christian many of your friends will ever know. Your private time. You need guardrails in your private time because what you do in private does manifest itself in public, your TV, social media, music, internet, all of what we consume. You've got to have balance in your life, your friendships. Next week, I'm going to talk about my message is, why can't we be friends? And we're going to talk about what that means. The people I hang out with is who I become. By the way, that is not a theological statement only. It's not a behavioral statement only. It is a neurological fact. I'll share that with you next weekend. Then our dating life, you know, if you're dating, that person you're dating, I, I would challenge you, don't say things like this, yeah, we don't agree on church, or we don't agree on politics, or we don't agree on this, but we love each other. Yeah, talk to me a year from now, once you're married. Those little things will become the biggest issues in your marriage. They may divide you. You need parameters before you get there. You need guidelines and guardrails. Your married life, loving your spouse the way God intended you love her, making the commitment, not playing the game. Yeah, I love you, but I'm not all in. Being committed. And then your finances, it's God's money. Now, to close out, we want to look at how to put these practical applications into place, how to really have guardrails that protect my life. Before we do, Ephesians 5 drives this, okay? So for the next 10 minutes, just look at this. First of all, so be very careful how you live, not being like those with no understanding, but live honorably with true wisdom, for we are living in evil times. I wonder what Paul would have wrote today. Take full advantage of every day as you spend your life for his purposes, and don't live foolishly 
for then you will have discernment to fully understand God's will. And don't get drunk with wine, which is rebellion. Instead, be filled continually with the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an example of a guardrail in a person's life and how culture treats it. Um, The late Reverend Billy Graham, regardless of what you think of Billy Graham or his approach, he was by all means the most influential evangelist of the last hundred years, maybe the last couple hundred years, okay? That being said, he had a rule. It was called the Billy Graham rule. And his rule was, I don't go out to eat with a person of the opposite sex who isn't my wife or without my wife. I don't travel with them. I don't go and check in in hotels when they're in the other room. I don't do that. And he lives by 75 years of ministry, literally with a pristine character. People made fun of it at first. But because he was a reverend, they let it go. Then, about four years ago, another guy talked about living by the Billy Graham rule. And again, regardless of what you think of his politics, Vice President Mike Pence says, I live by the Billy Graham rule. I dare you to go back and read the way he was crucified in all of the media outlets. People say, oh, this is, 20, 20, this is a 21st century. Come on, man. That's just putting women down. It's, it's saying they're weak. And we're, uh, Mike Pence said, I'm, I'm going to live by this rule. Well, the Harvard Business Report wrote a really interesting article. I went back and read it, and it's interesting. I may not agree with much of it, but they said this. Hey, we can't expect men and women not to travel together, not to be alone together, married people together. So they said, here's our conclusion. This is a quote. said, so what's involved, uh, what's an involved male leader to do? So there's a question. In simplest terms, become what we call a thoughtful caveman. Okay, that's helpful. Men, be a thoughtful caveman, okay? So I'm gonna read on. It went on later to say this. Healthy, mature, self-aware men understand and accept their distinctly male neural architecture. What does that mean? It's, it's kind of funny because well-adjusted, mature men may not need guardrails. And most women would say, if you find one of those, capture them, put them in a laboratory. We need to study them and clone them. Right, ladies? Listen, man, every man and every woman needs to admit they need guardrails. And this is the way the world approaches that. Well, if Billy Graham sets a standard in his life, he sets that standard, as did Mike Pence, with this philosophy, good, better, best, never let it rest till good is better and better is best. You're always striving for what is better. So three things to send you home with. Putting up the guardrails means I invest great care in how I live my life. I'm always baffled at how Christians will put a ton of care into their business, ton of care into their money-making, ton of care into their fun and their parties and their hobbies, and zero care in the way they live their life. Look at this in Ephesians 5.15. So be very careful how you live. That word live, you might circle it. It's the Greek word peripateo. It literally means this, how you walk. In other words, take note of every step I take in life. Because all around me is danger and evil. Now, I'm not going to be a you know, prophet of doom, but here's a good way to think about it. If you have a big dog, you know what it's like to walk carefully in the backyard, right? Our first dog was a Siberian Husky when we got married, and she had a little bit of a stomach problem. I found that out one night when I went outside in our little backyard and forgot to turn the light on. It was everywhere. And so the next time I turned the light on and I was careful where I walked. So you want a nugget of spiritual truth? Watch where you walk or you're going to land in crap. Okay? (laughs) Live honorably with true wisdom. Here's a question that I try to ask. I wish I asked it every time, but I try to ask before I do anything. And I would encourage you to do this. In light of my present situation, my current state of affairs, and my future plans, is this the wisest decision to make? Because it's not enough. If somebody tells me don't do something, that usually sends me the other direction. So I want to know the wise approach. In light of my present situation, current state of affairs, and my future plans, is this the best decision to make? How many marriages would be saved 
if a man would have asked that question? How many marriages would be saved if a woman had asked that question before getting emotionally connected? How many, you know, violent acts would have been uh, derailed? We can just go down the list. Mm -hmm. Ask that question. Also, having guardrails will help us to do the next idea here, which is to avoid stupid decisions <laughs> and keep a sober mind. So, ladies, make sure you elbow your husband right now. <laughs> we just pick on guys because we <laughs> is one. Yes. All right? So... <sighs> You know, God has provided us something specifically for this purpose to avoid making stupid decisions in our life. And that thing is summed up in one word. It's the word wisdom. Look what it says here in Ephesians 5, 15. It says, but live honorably with true wisdom, for we are living in evil times. Take full advantage of every day as you spend your life for his purposes. Mm. So this passage says that we need to have wisdom to live in evil times. Now, I don't know if you were like me, but I know when I was younger, when you talked about wise people, mm. in my mind, I pictured an old guy with white hair. In fact, <laughs> I guess I looked in the mirror, you know, because I am that guy now. But that's what I thought about, about wise people. They had to be old. They had to be, you know, have uh, gray hair. But that's not true. And there's a definition of wisdom that I was given once that I love it. Uh, Listen to what this definition says. It says, wisdom is the ability to tell the difference between what is right and what is wrong. And then to be able to tell the difference between what is good and what is best and then choosing to do the best. You know, so the first part of that, that's where our Christian ed department comes in. We have to know what the Bible says because that's where God defines what's right and wrong. I should... Mm -hmm check everything I believe with what the Bible teaches because it's the truth. That's what's right or wrong. So we have to know the Bible to be wise. But then to be able to discern, there are some things that there's nothing wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with doing them, okay? It's not sinful. But it's not the best use of your time either. If I sat, I watch TV. I'm a History Channel, Discovery Channel type of guy. You know, I watch all those, all those shows, Um, but if I sat at home and watched TV for eight or 12 hours a day, there's nothing sinful in that, but there's not anything wise in that either. I should be able to discern, okay, I could use my time that way, but what's the best way to use it and then decide to do that best thing. Say, Pastor Mark, how could you use the word stupid? We don't use the word stupid in our house. Well, God does. Um, right here, Ephesians five, don't be stupid. Instead, find out what the Lord wants you to do. Don't destroy yourself by getting drunk, but let the Spirit fill your life. Now, this passage takes a really unique turn there. It says, don't get drunk. You're like, oh boy, is this a sermon about not drinking alcohol? No, that's not what the Bible says. Matter of fact, in this period of time, it was safer to drink wine than water. You drink wine, you might get drunk. You drink water, you might be dead. That's truth. So, Wine was a staple, and yes, it was fermented, all right? That's a comment for all my legalistic friends. It was fermented. But what he's saying is don't get drunk. Mark, we both have come to a conclusion. We had never had this conversation. Tell, tell me your story real quick. So I was, um, <clears throat> when I was growing up, my dad was an alcoholic, and he wasn't a happy drunk. Uh, so it just wasn't a good situation for my mom or for my brother and I. And so even when I was younger, I remember thinking, I would never want to put my wife or my children Hmm. through that. And so as I grew older, um, I also learned then that some addictive behaviors, perhaps like alcoholism, um, they might have their roots in genetics. In other words, it's something that can be passed on genetically. So when I got married, my wife and I, we had this discussion and I said, look, I know what it's like to live under an alcoholic dad and it's horrible and I don't want the kids to ever have to suffer that so I want to put a guardrail in place for me Mm. so while our kids are at home let's just decide we're not ever going to have alcohol in the house not so much yeah you know teenagers are going to get into it but for my benefit because I did not want to become my dad and so because of that to protect my wife and kids I decided that Not that it was evil or wrong, but 
I didn't want to fall down that rabbit hole. You know, it's interesting. I, I got an article this week from my mom on our family, the Native American family from Oklahoma, and it said the Bratton, Native American Bratton family was the most prestigious family in Oklahoma. We, we never even knew that. We sure didn't act prestigious. But as I was reading that, I read it about my great uncle and my grandfather, and both were alcoholics. My great grandfather, my uncles, almost every one of my Native American family members. And that's not putting them down. I loved them. They were amazing people, but it was so destructive. So I came to the same conclusion Shelly and I both did. We'd seen the damage of it. We're like, I'm not going to wrestle the rattlesnake. I'm just not going to mess with that. I know my behavior. It's OCD anyways. And so I'm not going to go down that path. He says, don't get drunk. That's the specific command, but it's why? Because it's stupid, irresponsible, and absolutely nothing comes from it. I've never heard anybody say, I wished I'd have been drunk or my marriage would have been better. <laughs> I wished I'd have got drunk just a few more times and we'd have had such a great relationship. Nobody says that. If I'd have just been drunk one more time, I might not have slept with that person. Nobody says that. Okay? So that's where you have to develop a guardrail. Whatever your guardrail is, put it in place. There's four specific areas. The first is in my family and my friend relationships. I've got to have guardrails and know that the people I hang out with are going to determine who I am, and we'll talk about that next week. The second area is my character and reputation. Um, I think we're all familiar with the saying, they're a chip off the old block. <laughs> So we understand when we hear that, that he or she, we're saying, is just like their parent. You know, that's what we need to be as Christians. We need to be a chip off the old block. Yeah. We need to be just like Jesus. That's what the Bible says. And that's what it means to have good character. So the way you guard your character is by asking yourself, what would Jesus do? And that would be good character. The second part is your reputation. Hmm. You know, I think this is true, but it really stinks for God that people will form opinions about God based on you and yeah. based on me. Yeah. They'll look at our behavior and they'll make a judgment about what God is like. Mm -hmm. You know, we experience this all the time. You're in a grocery store. There's the kid in the cart screaming at the top of their lungs, throwing a temper tantrum. And what are you thinking? What? Come on, parents. That's your job. Get, you know, you judge the parent based on the behavior of the child. Yeah. Well, that's what people do. Yeah. And so we need to make sure that we guard our reputation because we're guarding God's reputation. Whenever I do something... And, you know, people love to call us hypocrites, and we are all hypocrites because we're sinners, but we want to become less of a hypocrite as time goes on so that people don't blame God for what we do. Then my time management. We need guardrails in time management. I had a person say to me, because my life is pretty much scheduled for the next two years, I would never do that to myself. I would never plan. I don't plan like that. I said, if you don't plan then you'll never have time to do the things you want to do. You'll never be able to live for God's purposes if you don't plan. And then the last thing is my faith and values. You know, since the truth is found in God's word and it defines the path that I am to walk, I need to make sure that what I believe is true agrees with the Bible, okay? Because it is the truth. And so... I need to make a commitment that I believe that the Bible is God's word to the point where I say, if what I think is different from what God says in his word, I'm the one who's wrong. So the greatest dark, uh, guardrail that you can put up in your life is a total commitment to believe that what the Bible says is true. Mm -hmm. And then base your life on what it says, that that is the highest value of your life that will guard you from more bad stuff than anything else you can do amen and and that's fueled by the specific response don't be drunk with wine but be filled with the holy spirit let the holy spirit completely control your life that's what you do when you yield to god's word you're in fellowship with other christians you're serving god's purposes and i want to just say this some of you may be thinking man my alcohol problem is a big deal it's not a small deal it's not a joke let us help you get through this. Celebrate Recovery is the greatest resource we have in this ministry for hurts, habits, and hangups. It doesn't have to be an addiction. It could be a hurt. It could be a hangup. 
But for those who know uh, what this is about, they could tell you, we could have hundreds of testimonies today of people who say, Wednesday night, Celebrate Recovery has changed my life. Come out, 5.30, they'll feed you, 6.30, start worship. They either have a teaching from Pastor Barry or a testimony the following week. There's some share time. You can share if you'd like to in the small groups. But it is based on the principles in God's word from the Beatitudes that really give you victory over this addiction. And we do that by intentionally being quiet enough to listen to God because we don't like quiet. We want noise. All of us. I'm a person that needs things happening all the time just to be able to think. But God wants us to be quiet and know that he's here. Sometimes I just sit at my desk and I just listen and pray. And finally, we're going to close with this. Worship God through every victory and defeat so I can truly grow in Christ. Worship God through every victory so I can truly grow and every defeat. You know, that's part of the spiritual life. And Ephesians 5, 19 through 20 says, And your hearts will overflow with a joyful song to the Lord. I want to encourage you. Even if you don't have a great voice or you can't carry a tune in a bucket, sing because God loves a joyful noise, okay? (laughs) Keep speaking to each other with words of scripture, singing the Psalms with praises and spontaneous songs given by the Spirit. Always give thanks to the Father God for every person he brings into your life in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's that command? Mm -hmm. Worship together as believers. That's why we come together together. And we do it so God receives the glory through the gospel. So God receives the glory. Look at Hebrews 1.3. The sun is the dazzling radiance of God's splendor, the exact expression of God's true nature, his mirror image. He holds the universe together and expands it by the mighty power of his spoken word. He accomplished for us the complete cleansing of sins and then took his seat on the highest throne at the right hand of the majestic one. Mark He is the essence of the gospel. Share that with us. Um, If you're here visiting with us today, a lot of this stuff that we've talked about today, it's really kind of common sense when you think about it. Just protecting yourself, setting up barriers to keep yourself from getting hurt. It's just that we're talking on a spiritual level. And you say, you know, I, I can agree with that. I can see the importance of that. But you know when you were talking about that second birth thing, I... I just don't get that. Well, probably more than anything else, if you're visiting with us today, that's what we want you to get. Because you see, contrary to what I was taught when I was brought up in church, getting to heaven, having a relationship with God has nothing at all with what you do. Doesn't matter if you're going to church, doesn't matter if you're keeping the Ten Commandments. And the reason is because, see, we're all sinners. We all do things wrong. But what most people don't understand is heaven is a perfect place. God is a perfect being, and if he let us in as sinners, then we would make heaven become just like earth. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be absolutely perfect to get to heaven, but none of us are. So no matter how hard you try to do whatever you think is right, you can't be good enough. That's the whole reason Jesus came to earth, was because we can't save ourselves. And God knew that, so he sent his son to die on the cross and to make a complete payment for all of our sins. Mm -hmm. And friend, the Bible says all you can do to have eternal life, to live with God forever, is to put your trust in Jesus as your only hope of getting to heaven. You're not going to trust yourself. You're not going to trust how good you are. You're going to put your trust in him. And that's what we would encourage you to do if you get nothing else from this message. Why don't we close with a word of prayer? Just bow your head, close your eyes. And what I like to do here is, if you're saying, you know, Mark, for the very first time, I understood that. I I understand what Jesus did for me, that I'm a sinner, that I can't be perfect. I can't be good enough. Hmm. And so right now, let me encourage you, just talk to God in your own mind. Just say, Lord, I know I do things wrong. I'm a sinner. But now I understand that all I need to do is put my trust in your son and what he did for me. So right this moment, I'm going to... I'm going to put my trust in Jesus and him as my only hope of getting to heaven. Friend, the moment you do that, right here this morning, you are born again. You have a new birth. You are God's child. And so if you say, Mark, 
that makes sense. I'm going to ask you to slip your hand up. This doesn't save you. All it just says to me is you're saying, Mark, that made sense to me. And today I'm trusting Christ as my Savior. Would you slip your hand up and just put it down real quick? You know, God bless you. God, God bless, bless you. you. Praise the Lord. That is so cool. God bless you. You can put it down. You know, I'm going to ask you to do one thing for me, for those of you who raised your hand. We'd love to know who you are. So there's two things we'd like, one of two things we'd like you to do. Either text the word believe to our church uh, phone number, which is 720-895-9000. Or on your way out, stop at, at our Connection Center. Fill out a visitor card. Let us know you're there. They'll give you a free gift. We'd love to give you something uh, on your way. And you might want to consider this. Maybe our Fresh Start with God class next Sunday at 9 o'clock. Mm -hmm is your next step Amen. in learning what it means to be a believer. Amen. Father God, thank you. Thank you for the tremendous power of the gospel message and for these many who came to know you today. Lord God, we, we commit our lives to being people who want to bring you glory and want to live a life that's exciting and enjoyable, not a life of regrets, but a life that uh, it's adventurous and it has guardrails. And so, Father, I pray that we would all make this commitment over the course of these next five weeks to be a part of this, to see how you're going to align our lives in a way that brings you glory and gives us the ability to live for your purposes. In Jesus' name, amen.